Some years ago I built an RSSI meter using a cool old gauge with a moving coil mechanism. It can detect, for example, amateur radio or older mobile phones. However, often it cannot detect modern radio systems because it doesn't cover higher frequencies and it's only detecting low power transmitters as long as they are only centimeters away. My idea is now to pimp the device using an RF sensor and an Arduino processor board. In case you are interested to build such a device from scratch or you want to upgrade your existing RSSI meter, I strongly recommend to watch episodes number 19, 20, 21 and 22. The previous episodes are explaining the complete build of a digital version. I explain it only briefly here. The given concept is using an AD8318 chip to measure RF power between 1 MHz and 8 GHz in a power range from minus 65 to plus 5 dBm. The Arduino Nano is in parallel processing the measured data and the voltages from three analog inputs. In the earlier episodes we developed also the code for it. The little device has a NeoPixel ring display. In this new project we want to use a cool old gauge instead, reusing the concept and the software. With some changes in the proven software we can realize this project with minimum effort. We keep some interesting features like the pcold function or the USB interface which we use to lock the measured data on a PC. My RSSI meter looks pretty old style, but I like the look and the build quality. Many radio amateurs are using this kind of device which gives the ultimate physical evidence that signals are sent out. However, it hardly works for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and other modern radio services because it is lacking sensitivity and frequency bandwidth. My idea is to reuse hardware and software from an earlier project to improve the performance. I developed already a digital version of the RSSI meter. In case you are interested, please view episodes number 19, 20, 21 and 22. For the upgrade of my old RSSI meter, we need to talk about the layout and the hardware of the Arduino Nano. Since we don't want to repeat all the stuff here that was explained in the earlier episodes, I will concentrate on the changes in the software. Finally, we will resume some insights. And of course, I will show some demos. Next, let's talk about the features that we can realize. In my existing old RSSI meter, I have one potentiometer instead of two in the new digital version. This gives us some constraints for the features. Of course, we want to display the actual current RSSI value in dBm on our nice old gauge. Since we have a pcold function in our software, we want to have the choice between the current value and the peak value. With the switch we can change between the two measurement modes. 
The potentiometer shall change its function according to the mode. In the normal mode it shall control the gain in a range between factor 1 and 5. In the peak hold mode it shall control the peak hold time between 0.1 second and 20 minutes. The increase of the peak hold time shall be exponentially. For obvious reasons the peak hold function helps us a lot in case RF signals are short and rare. In addition we use an LED which gives us an indication of the field strength by its intensity. The use of analog inputs remains the same. We can measure three analog voltages simultaneously. However, in this project I'm using different voltage dividers so that I can measure up to 20 volts instead of 10. The PC interface also remains the same as in the digital version with the NeoPixel display. With that interface we can control the data logs and we can store the measured data using a terminal program. On the back side of the housing there will be LEDs which indicate when data is sent either in text mode or in the comma separated values mode. They also remain the same as in the NeoPixel version. I'm working a lot with spreadboards. They are particularly good when you want to try out a new concept in hardware and software. The video clip here is giving just a short impression, but in reality I spend a lot of time on this level to try out a number of different options. And I'm performing a lot of tests in order to see whether the whole concept is resilient. Let's have a look to the hardware layout of the Arduino Nano board. We start with the pins on the left side in our sketch. In this project we can make our life a bit easier as in the previous one with the NeoPixel display. Here we do not need a high current for the display. So we can connect the power supply for the AD8318 board to the Arduino's 5 volts pin instead of creating a USB breakout. The step up converter draws about 100 milliamperes. Together with about 0.7 volts voltage drop from the regulator on the Arduino board we can calculate that the regulator needs to dissipate about 70 milliwatts heat. This seems to be bearable for the little Arduino Nano board. The analog input A0 is used for the RSSI signal from the sensor. A1, A2 and A3 are used to measure external voltages over voltage dividers. I will explain them in a minute. The pin A5 is used for the potentiometer that controls the peak hold time and the gain. The pin 4 originally was used to adjust the gain in the previous project. We connect it to ground since we don't use it in this project. On the right side almost everything remains the same. Pin 10 is the output pin for the LED that indicates CSV data sending. Pin D9 is for the LED indicating the peak hold mode and D5 is for the LED that indicates text data sending. Pin D8 is used as a digital input for the switch to change the peak hold mode. There is now one additional pin in use. We use pin D11 as a pulse width modulated output that controls the moving coil gauge and the field strength indicator LED. 
This time I respected my own recommendation from the last project. Yeah, well, sometimes it's good to listen to your own speech. I added calibration trimmers to the voltage dividers. The trimmers are dedicated to compensate the tolerances of the resistors. This makes the calibration a bit more convenient. I can use a screwdriver instead of changing the code by different calibration factors for each input. The voltage dividers are dimensioned for the range from 0 to 20 volts. As in the last project, there is a capacitor that blocks RF signals which could possibly come through the banana connectors. The second capacitor reduces noise from digital signals that might appear at the Arduino analog inputs. The pictures are giving us an impression of the hardware. On the left we have the voltage dividers that we need for the three analog inputs and on the right side we have the housing with the new RF sensor board already mounted to the bottom. You can also see the three banana sockets that are mounted on the back side of the housing. The old SMA socket I replaced with an N socket which is sturdier and more durable. The black cable is a USB extension cable. With that I get a sturdy USB socket on the back of the housing. It is always a good idea to label your cables, because this helps to avoid mistakes and damages. And by the way, here is a cool tip for you. I found an easy way to label my cables. I just used a marker to write directly on the heat shrinks that I'm using always a lot in my projects. Inside the housing we see now the complete electronics comprising the RF sensor hidden by the voltage divider board and the board carrying the step-up converter and the Arduino Nano. Ok, that's it on the hardware side. I have used the NeoPixel version of our device really frequently for short measurements as well as for data logs over days. The software that we developed turned out to be really reliable. Up to now I had no crash or deadlock. That's why I decided to reuse the software with adaptations instead of creating a complete new one. This means that parts of the software are no longer used, however they remain in the code. In this episode I will only talk through necessary changes and adaptations instead of running through the complete code as I did in episodes number 21 and 22. In the top section here I made some comments while I worked on the hardware and the changes in the code. We said that we want to use a pulse width modulated output to control our gauge. That's why we need to add the corresponding command to our setup void. Then we go to the main loop. Remember that we changed the voltage dividers. 
That is why we need to change the computation of the voltage from our analog inputs. In lines 543 to 545 we need to change a factor to 4.1 because we want to calibrate to a 20 volts range. The input A5 is used to read the potentiometer. We use it now for two purposes instead of one. It controls the gain for our gauge and it controls the peak hold time. And then from line 612 onwards we have to do some changes to control the gauge. Depending on the status of the switch, we will write the current signal or the peak value to our pulse with modulated output. Of course, there are some new variables to be defined for the additions and the changes. I missed that to mention. But that's it. We are done with the adaptation of the code. There were surprisingly few. Very good. However, the much bigger benefit comes from the fact that the effort for the testing and debugging is significantly lower compared to complete new code. As you might know, testing and debugging usually takes five times more time and effort than coding. Maybe I'm a bit anachronistic and old-fashioned here but from a pure design point of view, I like the old analog gauges. There is something alive about them that appears also somehow mysterious to me. In any case, definitely someone put effort into the design, which I humbly respect here. Ordinary Wi-Fi signals are always good to demonstrate the capability of the little device. First, we look at the normal mode, which shows us the current RF signals that are in the air. We can increase the gain by a factor of 5. Please be aware that our gauge has a logarithmic scale in dBm. On a linear scale, this would correspond to a factor of 10,000. In this example, we can see that a mechanical gauge has its limitations when it comes to short signals. Because of its mass moment of inertia, it doesn't reach the peak value when the signal is short. That's why we have the peak hold mode. When we switch to the peak hold mode, the potentiometer adjusts the peak hold time between 0.1 seconds and 20 minutes. It helps to find and measure short and rare signals. The yellow LED lights up to indicate this mode. The gain remains 1 in this mode, so that we can read the peak value in dBm from the gauge. I think for modern wireless systems that are typically sending short bursts, this is the more interesting measurement mode for the gauge. The red LED is always indicating the RSSI intensity in both modes. The data logging capabilities are exactly the same as in the previous project. In case you are interested in that, I made several measurement demonstrations in the episodes number 10, 19, 20, 21 and 22. The insights and the summary. The pulse width modulated output of our Arduino Nano works well to control a gauge with a moving coil mechanism. Old RSSI meters with no amplifier 
are typically using gauges that work with very low current. They are specified with 50 microamperes. They are rather expensive and have a fragile mechanism. In case you use one of these, you need to choose a higher resistance in series. However, we can use an electric gauge, which is more resilient, because the Arduino is able to drive up to 30 mA. I dimensioned the given serial resistors for an electric gauge that is specified for one or 2.5 mA. These are still common and cheap. And by the way, I designed and printed the DBM scale myself. Occasionally I will explain how. Controlling an electric gauge using an Arduino seems to be a good concept in general, because it is safe. There is no danger to overload and damage the gauge, as it was in my old concept. We dimensioned the resistor network as such that 100% pulse width at 5 volts leads to full scale deflection. This has the advantage that whatever gain we adjust with our potentiometer, there is no chance to damage the gauge. Usually, the software development takes most of the time and effort in our projects. It really is a huge benefit when you can reuse proven software. Compared to starting from scratch, I had a huge advantage in the little DIY project. By reusing my software that I developed for a digital version, it was only a minor effort to adapt and test it. Hope you enjoyed the episode as much as me. I put the little device as a gadget on my desk. It always makes people curious when it starts indicating activities from any Wi-Fi device or from a mobile phone. And Arduino is really fun to learn and apply in projects. Now stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe and support the channel. See you soon in the coming episodes. Bye.